Go ahead. Let me know. Yep. Go ahead, Lisa. Yep, you're ready. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Business Insights, a live weekly webinar where a panel of industry thought leaders from business advisory, tax, risk management, property, superannuation and investments, employment and HR give their insights into the current economic and financial landscape that impacts small to medium sized businesses around Australia during this pandemic and beyond. Business Insights is where people in business go to know. My name's Lisa Garrido and I am proud to host this morning's webinar, introducing the panel of small business leaders in their area of expertise. We have Adam Lyle from O'Brien Palmer. Hi Lisa, how are you? Very good, thank you. Ian McLaughlin from Imperium Accounting and Tax. Hi Lisa, thanks very much for having me today. Cool, Sam Gureshi from Money Clip Group. Oh, hi, Lisa. Thanks for being on board. Thank you. Rob Skeen from Oasis, Oasis Skeen Property. Hi, Lisa. Hi, hi, viewers. Thanks for having me. And Bernard Tuimau from MGA Insurance. Hi, Lisa. Hey, panelists. And yours truly, Lisa Garrido from Enigma HR. For our viewers and subscribers on YouTube, Facebook and LinkedIn, the views and opinions shared on this webinar are designed to be general information only and are not designed to be taken as specific advice for your specific circumstances. Please feel free to reach out to our panel for specific advice to meet your requirements. Adam, you're up first. There appears to be a lot of support available to business. Do you think more is going to come? Yeah, I think it is actually. Um, look, the commentators, the economic commentators in a broad sense are basically saying that um, given the recession, without government support from all different levels, the recession will deepen and widen. Um, that's a worrying uh, concern. And without that extra support, the reality is that you're going to have a very real uh, chance that those concerns that are being raised quite openly now that we could fall into a depression will be exacerbated and extended. Now, technically speaking, we only need one more uh, quarter of negative growth um, before we go into a depression. Of course, the government, federal government are going to be very reluctant to announce something like that. Um, the RBA and the government have already had talks in the last couple of weeks about such an announcement. Um, all of those talks are obviously on the quiet, but the RBA's policy is that you don't need a declared recession for it to be one. It, technically, we were in recession before the government announced it. So for the RBA to form a view that we could fall into a depression, which economically means having four quarters in a row of negative growth, then the reality is that we could be standing into danger. Now, the way around that is to be fiscally uh, um, energetic and provide extra support. We've already seen talk over the weekend of additional extensions to the JobKeeper and JobSeeker payments. Ian's probably got a plethora of information hitting his airwaves which I'm sure he'll share with all the viewers here. But I want to stress a couple of points on this particular issue. Government support is really important and every business should take and make available to themselves of every type of support available to them. But reliance on that support in the absence of other opportunities and other issues that you might want to address within your business is dangerous. You've really got to make sure that you are approaching this with balance. Because imagine just for a moment, JobKeeper stop tomorrow. Imagine just for a moment that one of the other support mechanisms that you've been reliant on over this course stops tomorrow. Particularly in the, in the uh, environment where a lot of these support mechanisms are discretionary. They are absolutely discretionary. Then that reliance uh, and that overuse of support mechanisms could end up seeing your business crash hard. And people talk about heading to the edge of the cliff and all that sort of stuff. 
we could well be heading in that direction. So all I'm saying to everyone is take the money while you can. I know that sounds very cliche, but keep it in balance. Get really good advice. I mean, Sam and Ian are all over this like a rash. Um, you know, those who are, are watching this who don't have a really good accountant, a really good financial advisor in their, in their corner, they shouldn't be entering the fight without them. And, they, and if they haven't got good ones, consider Ian and Sam. Um, but we're not out of the woods yet. We're, we've got at least two quarters of stress to go. Victoria's second wave, if, if New South Wales survives without a uh, significant um, further introduction of um, COVID measures, I'd be very surprised. And that is only going to exacerbate the concerns about uh, the future of the economy. Um, Obviously, I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, but the sheer reality is lots of, some more, lots of more support coming. Take it while you can, but keep it in balance. Very good message indeed, um, Adam. Really strong message, very insightful. And on that note, I think let's move on to Ian. So Ian, you've been busy with tax returns, no doubt. What's the update in regard to individual tax returns that have been lodged in the ATO since the 1st of July? Yeah, thanks very much, Lisa. So some really interesting stats coming out of the ATO. So they recorded their biggest one July ever with a 640% spike on returns lodged. So on the 1st of July, there was over 740,000 returns lodged on that day, up from 100,000 on 1 July 2019. So an increase of 640,000 returns. So people are obviously really eager to get their refunds, which is expected. However, the ATO does warn that um, lodging early can bring mistakes. So obviously the first one is gonna be that the employer may not have finalized the single touch payroll details to the ATO, meaning that the ATO doesn't have all of your income. Okay, so when you go to put your, the, your, your income in your return, it's not gonna be there. So just a reminder that if your employer has over 20 uh, employees, they're not required to finalize that with the ATO until the 31st of July. And if it's under 19 employees, then it's the 14th of July. So you should be ready to go now. But what the ATO is seeing is, is that people were lodging early on the 1st of July, their employers hadn't yet finalized a single touch payroll, and now they're amending those assessments, okay? So it's a little bit of a messy situation there. So just make sure that when you do lodge, that your, uh, your employer has finalized those, those single touch payroll details. The other one is, is that they're notice, noticing a, uh, a lot of errors in the, the shortcut for work from home deductions. So what people are doing is, is they're doubling up. So the ATO introduced the, the shortcut method, which was basically the 80 cents. Um, and people are doubling up on that using the standard 52 cents for that same period. So once again, it's really important that uh, it may be easy to lodge these online, but you've got to make sure that you get this right because the ATO can impose fines and penalties for returns that are lodged incorrectly. The, the other issue that they're finding is that a lot of taxpayers are simply copying and pasting their deductions from 2019. So what I mean by that is, is let's say for the total uh, work-related deductions for 2019 were 5,000, then people are just simply putting in 5,000 for 2020. And the ATO has got a bit of an issue with that because in those deductions, you might have things such as uh, travel, mobile, and they're saying that, um, you know, because we've been in, in COVID and we've been in lockdown, that there may be some of those expenses that you wouldn't, you would have incurred last year year but you wouldn't even incur this year for example travel is one of those so you may not have incurred travel because you've been working from home a lot of the time so it's really important that you do work closely with an accountant to make sure that your return is is correct there so i just wanted to also touch on job keeper which adam talked about as well so look it's going to be really interesting to see what the government does on uh, thursday you know there's expected to be some announcements there with what they're going to do with job keeper and one of the major um criticisms of uh, the current job keeper scheme is that it's just a flat $3,000 per month or $1,500 per fortnight per employee. And in that, you know, people were getting pay rises and some people were getting pay decreases. So it's going to be really interesting to see what they do. And my personal thoughts are that they, um, uh, if, if they are going to extend it, 
um, it will probably be a, you, you, you have to do a retest of eligibility every month and it will probably just be for certain industries that have been the hardest hit. Um, so let's wait till next Thursday. So I'm really looking forward to next Monday when we can talk about that mini budget that the, the government's going to hand down. Thanks, Lisa. Oh, gosh, wise words once again, Ian. To be honest, I actually don't know how businesses are, are not consulting with an accountant um, and haven't been, you know, in the last three to four months at the very least. So, Sam, over to you. Any updates from your end? Um, yes, I'll, uh, I'll cover off interest rate. Um, thank you, Lisa. Uh, but just before that, uh, yeah, very good point you made, Ian, about the, the JobKeeper, um, catching up with some, uh, some friends on the weekend. Um, they've got people that run businesses and uh, those businesses can get people because their casuals don't want to go back to work because they're going to get less money than on JobKeeper. So I think making that tighter is definitely a good way for the businesses to be able to get the right employees back so that they can operate, basically. And so on the interest rate side, we had a, a quiet week. Um, really not a lot happened um, uh, over that period. Banks are making small tweaks at the moment to the rates, but nothing to get excited about. I guess the attention is going to be turned to the Treasurer's update coming up uh, shortly and how that's going to impact um, all of us. Uh, there are some indications though that the SME loan that was originally announced, um, previously up to 250,000, 50% 50 guaranteed for up to three years, and that's going to be updated to a, uh, a higher limit of 1 million and a five year term for them to be uh, paid back. Uh, I have to say that my experience to date has been that banks aren't really jumping over themselves to lend that money anyway. And the feedback that I've had is that they're only interested if the businesses take all their business to whatever that bank it is that they're going to lend the money. So, um, um, and that obviously that makes it harder for people to, to, get, to get the money. And obviously it's not in the spirit of how it's all meant to have worked out. Um, which is why when I was recently reading about it, only about one and a half billion dollars been lent in all this time. So hardly any of that money has been, been linked out, which is, I guess, you know, in some ways, I would actually put that to banks. Uh, one thing that I am seeing, though, is banks are making it very much mandatory to ask specific COVID-19 questions from, uh, from clients. And these have to be recorded in the application form. Uh, and they're making their decisions according to those updates. So essentially, the banks are asking uh, clients to declare their status of COVID-19 and using that as a way for them to lend money. So essentially getting the, the getting the, the information and literally lend, well, it could uh, lend itself to not being able to get any lending whatsoever. And um, so the very last thing is that the banks are struggling with their service levels still though, and uh, some are very much at the door. Um, one of the majors uh, is up to 40 business days for them to look at an application, which is uh, absolutely ridiculous in this time and age of uh, technology and uh, everything being electronic. Um, so, uh, of course, what's really important is stay in touch with your credit advisor uh, so that they can assist you with whatever approval that you need. Uh, and in particular, making sure that the approval that you are getting is worth the paper it's written on, because some banks are starting to only give you an approval that is not a real approval. Um, in fact, it's really just an acknowledgement that an application has been launched. So very important, make sure you go back and check on that specifically. And that's on the interest rate, Lisa. Great, thank you. Um, so now, Rob, what's the update on property market? Thanks, Lisa. And a big shout out to Dan Bly from Elevate Property who filled in for me last week. Really appreciate that. Uh, last weekend, 471 homes went under the gavel with a clearance rate of 64%, showing the property market is still holding up, but down 20% from pre-COVID levels. Some good news for property buyers with talks around the grounds last week of an early spring rush of property listings with many auction campaigns starting mid-August. Now that's welcome news for home sellers too, because many of these sellers who have been thinking of selling in 2020 but have held off due to COVID can finally be able to find a home that they can upgrade or downgrade to. And of course, once they buy, they need to sell. So my prediction is there'll be an enormous amount of property stock levels on the market in the last quarter, uh, last quarter of this year. More good news for the construction and local tourism industry. My heart is bursting with positivity this week, folks. 
Current statistics are showing with many of us not being able to travel overseas for our holidays in 2020, people are now opting to spend the money that they've saved to renovate, extend their homes, with stay at, ho at home or isolation entertainment, putting in cinema rooms, home gyms, teenage or parent retreats, swimming pools, music rooms, which is great for us, part-time DJs, just saying. Also adding, you know, you know, that extra living or entertaining spaces to their, to their lifestyles. Adam, perhaps you can finally get that dancer's pole that you've always wanted for your bar. <laughs> the most outrageous I've heard to date is a gentleman who built a fully lit tennis court on the roof of his Gold Coast home. Uh, you know, neighbor's not going to get upset. It's got nets, but, you know, he doubles it up. He uses it for his golf putting and, and a bit of basketball and uh, social recreation as well for his parties and stuff. Uh, wonderful lot for local tourism, as recently people are taking holidays to the Hunter Valley, the Blue Mountains, South Coast, or like my family, to Dubbo Zoo over these school holidays. There are so many beautiful and idyllic locations in New South Wales. So viewers, get your planning in early now for the Christmas holidays, because most of these gorgeous destinations will book out, I'm sure. But for insurance, please make sure that there is a refund policy just in case we go into further restrictions. That's all from me this week, folks. Viewers, if you like the video, please smash the like button. Please smash the subscribe button. Please also comment if there's anything that you'd like to know about in the property market for next week's episode. That's all from me. Thanks, guys. Here, here. Good one. Good promo, Rob. That's very interesting, actually, your, your update, given that, as Sam just mentioned, there are kind of like more uh, restrictions in, or due diligence, really, in terms of lending. But the property market is seeming to be still boosting, which is good. How long? We don't know, but we should just keep our fingers crossed. Hey? So now, Bernie, um, in the last few weeks, you've been talking about management liability. So can you give us further updates on what businesses are, businesses are doing regarding that to protect themselves? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, obviously, Lisa, um, over the last couple of weeks, has spoken about the importance of uh, employers complying on, and understanding their obligations to its employees. So... Um, you know, maybe things such as working from home, you know, return to work, um, the update on, uh, I guess, the award rates. And like you mentioned a, a couple of weeks ago, Lisa, uh, the claim that related uh, the work health and safety breach where someone was ser seriously injured. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to speak about the importance of having management liability, management liability insurance. So, what does that protect? That protects the management practices of the business. So, the policy is broken up into several parts. Uh, it's broken up into the directors and officers insurance section. Um, it's broken up into the employment practices liability, the statutory liability, and uh, lastly, uh, but just as important, employee crime. So you can imagine being a director, you know, having to sell your, your assets to defend an allegation against you as a director or, not, or an officer of the business. Um, management liability covers these types of things. It covers employment practices liability. So claims that relate to the employer and employee relationship. So things such as, um, you know, award rates, things such as breaches to the Employment Practices Act, um, things such as fines and penalties, uh, things such as, again, the relationship between the employer and employee. Now, statutory liability talks about the fines and penalties of the businesses. It covers the business in the event that a fine is issued against the business. So in the scenario, Lisa, that you gave uh, where the business was issued a, a heavy fine by work health and safety, basically the statutory liability section of the policy is there to look at claims and cover claims in relation to fines issued against the business. Um, employee crimes. So this relates to claims uh, where an employee has either falsified invoices and, and has taken money from the business or has taken physical stock. So these are the types of claims that we tend to come across from time to time. And so making sure that you have a uh, policy such as management liability that covers these types of things is very important, not only for your big end of town, but also your small SME. So um, that's it for me this week, Lisa, and um, look forward to hearing your update. Thanks, Bern. Um, and speaking of employment practices, well, just last week, the federal government has unveiled its latest skills investment program called the Job Trainer. Its focus is on training or reskilling those for a job amid the pandemic in the areas of high demand. So the key points of the program are 
the program will create about three hundred forty thousand dollars, uh, three hundred forty thousand training places. Rather, the courses on offer will be in growth areas like healthcare, manufacturing, and trade. And the government is putting an extra one point five billion dollars towards its apprenticeship wage subsidy scheme and the billion dollar scheme will be partly funded by the government which will chip in 500 million dollars and with it, with the other half matched by split contributions between states and territories that sign up so as well as the job trainer the government also announced it will put an extra 1.5 billion towards its apprentices and trainee wage subsidy program so what is the job trainer it's the latest in the government's job set. You know, we have job keeper, job seeker, job maker, now job trainer, as a package that aims to create around 340,700 places nationwide to train school leavers or reskill people who are currently looking for a job. The program will provide people with the opportunity to complete short courses related to a number of industries that will either be free or at low cost. The idea clearly is to give people who may be struggling to find work because of the pandemic or facing a tough job market once they leave school, a chance to develop skills in the areas newly formed by the National Skills Commission, NSC, that will be skills in high demand in future. So really what I'd like to cover is what kind of jobs are covered within this training subsidy? So the government said that there are target areas um, that will be covered by job trainer, and it'll be worked out by the NSC in consultation with the states. It's flagged healthcare, for instance, social assistance, transport, postal and warehousing, manufacturing, retail trade, and wholesale trade as industries that are ones for future job growth. Um, what exact qualifications or course content will still be uh, unveiled to us in the near future. So in our profession as HR specialists, though, and to have our finger on the pulse, we rely on what the job market tells us in terms of what's on demand and through looking at job boards and more specifically through our recruitment providers who really are in the cold face of the job seekers. What the coronavirus change has done is it's changed the job market almost overnight and there is now an increasing number of opportunities available so many industries in fact remain active in seeking um, staff and there is an uptick in certain job areas and this is coming from a survey by Hayes and of course if you just did um, a survey on the job boards the areas are interestingly enough IT life sciences marketing, accountancy, yay, Ian, HR, yay, Enigma, banking, yay, Sam. And in particular, these jobs are um, in high demand. So the Hay survey points out to an increased focus on data and digital engagement. So since the coronavirus crisis began, 49% of employers in the survey said they have increased their adoption of agile work practices. 38% have increased their focus on digital engagement with their customers. 35% have invested in infrastructure or applications to facilitate remote working. Hello, hello. And 21% have increased their use of data to analyze business performance. The survey identified the soft skills that employers are prioritizing right now. So guess what? Top of the list is communication skills. Next, followed by adaptability. Next, teamwork. One third of the employers in the survey said they're currently hiring and only 19% have a recruitment freeze in place, which is a very interesting statistic. So let's talk about the job, um, jobs that are on high demand and interestingly see whether this matches what the National Skills Commission will tell us in future. So in IT, in infrastructure, software developers and engineers, cloud architects and engineers are in high demand. In life sciences, clinical researchers, sales and project managers, in marketing and digital, online and digital content writers, Internal change communication experts are in high demand. 
in accountancy and finance, financial accounting and reporting skills, budgeting and data analytics. In HR, obviously change management is big, organizational development and employee relations are in high demand. In banking, operations, risk analysts, managers, and sales. It'll be very interesting indeed when the details of the skills and jobs in demand come out from the National Skills Commission in the near, near future and see whether the states and territories are aligned with what this survey states. In my opinion, you know, we're always grateful for any assistance by the government in providing upskilling and training funding, which obviously will create opportunities. But what we really need to see now are businesses creating jobs where they need the skills now or retaining those with the skills. So continued funding in those areas should be made. Staff engagement and longevity is normally evident when we see employees working in jobs that they've studied for and they've trained for and invested in. These are jobs that they're really passionate about. So the effects on job retention, engagement and productivity ultimately will be an interesting study to make under the new normal. And especially when the job opportunities are in different areas and in different skills that are funded by the government, but may not necessarily be those that we, that people want to be in in the future. So that's really it for me. So there's lots of um, topics and questions to talk about. Does anybody have any questions for the panelists? I had a question for Sam. Sure. Uh, Sam, what's happening in the markets at the moment? Um, yeah, yeah, interesting. Uh, there's lots of news around economics um, right now, obviously end of the financial year and data is starting to come through. Um, firstly, unemployment uh, numbers came out for June. That was up 7.4%, uh, which was up on May, uh, with the real number sitting out somewhere in the vicinity of 11, which is taking into account people on JobKeeper and people who have been stood down um, for a period of time. Of course, that's concerning because uh, the real 11% is quite high. And, and often that number is bigger in, in uh, in young unemployment versus older and more established people. Uh, Adam, to your point, uh, yeah, government intervention is very important. Obviously, you need to um, uh, you know you need to have that, and the reality is that that might be the way that we're going to blast our way out of this mess. But it doesn't take away from the fact that yes, you should actually look at your business model and uh, be set up better going forward. Mm. Um, I guess one of the worrying signs um, that I've uh, been reading about, and you can attest to this as well, Ian. Uh, people have been taking more super out than it was expected. So in the first part of the, the two lots of 10,000, far too many people have been taking that out. And essentially, you know, a lot of people are going to uh, mortgage that to their, um, you know, for their future. So, um, so I guess a real important piece is that please, obviously that's a system to use. Do use it if you really need it and use it as your last option because you know you don't want to be in a position where you know not only you have this issue now but you'll have this issue in retirement that you know you're going to be short um, and that's going to be even a bigger issue for a long much longer period of time yeah but in the actual markets um asx had a good week um, they increased about 1.6 percent uh reporting season will kick off uh, at the end of july and rio tinto is one of our first big companies that's going to report They'll set the um, they'll set the mood. Um, Rio uh, has fared better because of the fact that iron ore prices have been doing well. But overall, the market is expecting about a 15% decline in earnings and profits in the financial year 20. Uh, and what it does look like that um, a lot of people will have to basically take that on their strides, uh, and how that how well they respond to that will determine how the share market will go. Uh, towards the end of July, start of uh, August. Um, most of the companies aren't providing any guidance still. So obviously that's an issue because you don't know what you're actually going to get yourself into if you're buying shares right now or if you're holding those shares. So, you know, there's a lot of faith being put into a future stability, basically, going forward. Um, obviously that lockdown, um, any further lockdown is going to have an impact on the, on the downside. And I guess really listening to the treasurer is going to be the key thing for us, um, um, you know, as, as a next piece, and uh, and knowing exactly how things are going to be uh, going. So 
you know, for now, I think you know markets are on a, in a bit of a wait and see, and and uh, and work out how this rule book of investing in pandemic times will continue to be written because it's very much a draft. You know, it's the first draft and it continues to get added to right now. Um, I guess in years to come, we'll work out whether we got it right or not, and that's from the, from the market. Yeah, I, I I completely agree, Sam. I think the whole process there for withdrawing super has just been ridiculous. To simply just go online and fill out a form, you know, I think there should have been some required sign-off from the wealth advisor, such as yourself, or the tax advisor, uh, such as myself. But just to go online and simply fill out a form and get ten grand one week and then ten grand the next week, I think it's just been crazy. Yeah. So I hopefully, you know, yeah, I, hopefully um, uh, people listening out there, if you are contemplating that the 2021 financial year, really have a chat to, to Sam um, and all myself as well in, in, in regards to that, because, you know, as Sam made mention, you, you are going to pay for that later. So, and you, you, you look at the, Sam, what were the requirements before, you know, severe financial hardship? And that's what it was before to, for, for, for someone under preservation age to withdraw money out of super. And now they just said, oh, if your wages drop by 20% or you've been made redundant, so I don't think that's in line with those previous um, financial uh, hardship um, rules, but you know I, I could be mistaken. So anyway, well, in 15 years of my time, we've only have been successfully applied to a superannuation account to release money on the grounds of uh, financial distress and so on, and even on compassionate basis, only on a couple of occasions. So it's such a tight rules around there, which is all gone out the door. And you know I'm I worry that you know I see things like people on the current affairs, you know, getting uh, surgeries done and buying cars and spending it all and think it's okay. Uh, obviously, it's, it is their money still, but not now. It's for their future. So, yeah, uh, yeah that, that's a concern. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I just add one more thing there? Only in the last two weeks, I've heard about people drawing down on their super to throw the money into their business and they haven't um, sought any protection for themselves whatsoever. And there's been no documentary, uh, no documentation of those loans to the companies. And on one in one occasion, uh, that company uh, has fallen over and they've lost that money, uh, even though the money was actually in the bank account of the company. Now, it's it's really I can't stress enough, everyone. You need to be talking to your financial advisor and your accountant before you make these decisions because they're there are really good ways to use that money and there are really bad ways to use the money. And I, I hate seeing people lose their money just for the will of it. You know, it's just, it just, it upsets me. So I'm hoping that people take on board the fantastic advice they're getting here on business insights. You know, one of my real concerns as well is the, um, you know, um, the continue work post September, as you said, Adam, in your, in your briefing, um, we are already seeing a large number of organizations planning for um, redundancies um, and they're going through the whole consultation process and being very compliant. But it just goes to show that, um, yes, we have the job trainer subsidy, which is good, but you know what is really needed in the organizations are the skills that are needed right now, not over a period of time. We need skilled people to continue doing their jobs so that the businesses can continue to deliver. Um, so it'll be very interesting what the treasurer will be saying on, on continued subsidy or continued job keeper payments. Um, we are already extremely busy with this whole change management process. It's quite a concern. Um, but as I said, you know, we're grateful for a job trainer program. It's more about um, what is the indicator of retention, longevity and productivity on, on in roles that you are somewhat um, forced to actually upskill in because that is all that is available and being funded in the market. Um, very interesting indeed. Um, now, Lisa, um, yes. He's making those announcements on Thursday. Um, yeah. I'm yeah. gonna, I'm going to steal Rob Skeen's thunder here and ask a, a polling question for all of our viewers as a joke of the day. If we've got job seeker, job keeper, job maker, job trainer, what's the next job thing that the government are going to come with? What's the next tagline? So maybe that's a bit of a joke of the day. Rob, what's your view on that? Uh, I think they're going to bring the uh, category job avoider. <laughs> <laughs> for those casuals 
that don't want to work because they're earning more on JobKeeper. Uh, correct. Um, so I actually had a question for you. You said earlier that, the, you know, there's stricter due diligence in terms of the questions about COVID. Now, just in line with privacy, what sort of questions are they asking about the COVID situation when one applies? Um, it, it all has to do with the circumstances around their expenses and also income. Um, it's very much about, you know, what is happening to their income? Are they expecting any changes to it uh, in particular? And um, nowadays, they, they're requesting even the employer to give a letter to say that there are no changes um, to, um, to, to their employment because of COVID. And in case of one of the lenders, it was quite interesting, they wanted a, a, a confirmation guarantee from the employer, employer that the employee is going to get their bonus next year. And, oh. you know, obviously next year is not here now. So, uh, so how can you get that guarantee? So, um, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's gone to a, a ridiculous level of type of questions that they want to ask. And there's nothing that the brokers can do to kind of negotiate that? Or is that that's part of the checklist in terms it's of the policy the now? So, policy. Part of the, yeah, so one of the lenders have made it a policy. So if you don't respond to the policy, um, you know, it's a, essentially it's assumed as if you're avoiding the subject and there's an issue. So you've got to basically be up front. And the reality is that if you are affected by COVID-19, well, maybe it's not the right time for you to buy a property or, or do something else and, and back them down. So you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with those, but it's just it just feels as if they've just gone this extra level on top of an extra level um, to, uh, to make it harder. All right, do we have any other questions from the panelists? Okay, well, that wraps up our live weekly webinar for all our viewers um, watching now or in or a little bit later on. Please like us, share us, share the posts, and we will look forward to seeing you again next week, especially after we uh, watch the Treasurer's report and know the budget. So have a great week ahead. Thank you for watching Business Insights, where people in business go to know. Thank you.